Your graces, my lords, reverend fathers, ladies and gentlemen, friends. Good evening. Welcome to the Usher Hall. Welcome to this wonderful occasion. Welcome also to all of those watching across the globe via live streaming. It's good to be here. My name is Barbara Dixon. I'm a native of Dunfermline in Fife. I live in Edinburgh and I'm a parishioner of St. Mary's Cathedral here. As we've just heard, over the past two millennia, the gospel of Jesus Christ has been a beautiful, benign influence which has suffused all aspects of cultural life across our native land with the love of God and care for neighbor, especially the most vulnerable. From the settlement of the great Hiberno-Scottish monastery on Iona, generation after generation have been able to say in unison with our great patron, Saint Andrew, we have found the Messiah. Thus flowed a Catholic culture shaped by the scholarliness of Saint Columba, the mercy of the great Saint Margaret, and the fervor of countless saints this nation has raised up in generations since. As Pope Saint John Paul II cautions us, we originate in a glorious past, but we do not live in the past. How then are we to evangelize our contemporary culture? To help answer that, we're delighted to be joined this evening by Bishop Robert Barron, a native of Chicago. Robert Barron is the Auxiliary Bishop of the Archdiocese of Los Angeles. Bishop Barron is also the founder of Word on Fire Ministry, a non-profit global media apostolate that reaches millions of people each year, drawing them into or back into a relationship with Jesus Christ and his church. Indeed, Bishop Barron's regular YouTube videos have been viewed over 30 million times. Meanwhile, he has over 1.5 million f followers on Facebook and is a number one Amazon best-selling author. Speaking for the first time in Scotland, this evening he will address the issue of proclaiming Christ in our culture. Ladies and gentlemen, Please welcome Bishop Robert Barron. Good evening to all. Well, that is most kind. Thank you, everybody. And what a spectacular place. One of the most beautiful places I've ever spoken in. And what a spectacular city this is. Uh, I was in Edinburgh, oh, many years ago, maybe 25 years ago, just for a very brief visit. But the last couple of days, I've, I've uh, made the rounds up to Colton Hill. I saw the castle today. Visited the tombs of David Hume and Adam Smith. The highlight, though, was last night we climbed up um, Arthur's seat, right? And I got a great view of the Firth of Forth and a great view of the city. Uh, just a, a joy to be here, but especially to be here for this purpose, to talk about the gospel, to talk about evangelization. You know, I got this invitation many months ago, and I've been thinking about it a lot, what I would say. And actually, I have in my uh, uh, notebook here a couple of different talks I thought I could present. But I'll tell you the truth. As I was praying about this, and I, I do pray about my talks, uh, what kept coming back to me was, talk about Jesus. Talk about Jesus. It was wonderful to hear these musical pieces, by the way, and the, and the narration was wonderful about the earliest proclamation of the gospel, the gospel being proclaimed here in this place, at the time considered probably the, the ends of the earth. That's still our call, everybody. See, Christianity is not a philosophy primarily. It's not a 
social theory. It's not a political program. Christianity is a relationship to this Jesus, which is why the renewal of the church, though it has institutional dimensions, though it involves practical changes and all of that, but the renewal of the church always has to do primarily with a return to Jesus Christ, a renewal of friendship with him. And see, when you become the friend of Jesus, and just what we heard, how wonderful about, about Andrew giving the, the message to Peter, we found the Messiah. Do you know, I've said this often, that what makes Christian literature, the earliest Christian literature, distinctive, when you compare it to all the other religious literature of the world, it doesn't sound like people musing philosophically about spiritual truths. It sounds like people who want to grab you by the shoulders and shake you and tell you something has happened. They want to tell you about this Jesus and what God has done through him. And see, everybody, it's still the same call. It's still the same responsibility. If the church loses its way, it's always because it's lost sight of him. If we've not evangelized successfully, it's because we've forgotten him. And so a return to Jesus kept coming to me in prayer. When you go to Scotland, talk about Jesus. So I will tonight. Uh, I, I've referred now a couple times to the crisis we're going through, this crisis of secularism. You know, it's interesting, isn't it, that this is a unique moment, really, in the history of humankind. From, from the beginning of recorded history, people have always been religious. Now, different types of religion, different understandings of it, but everybody, practically, in the history of humanity has been religious. Now, I mean, really for the first time, in the West anyway, we find a situation where an awful lot of people claim not to be religious. You know, in my country, back in the 1970s, when I was a, a kid, 3% of the United States would have claimed no religion. I mean, 97% of the country would have said, of course I believe in God, of course I'm religious. Now it's 25%. And my guess is it's probably worse over here in, in Western Europe. They say for those under 30, that number goes up to 40%. By the way, in my country anyway, among Catholics under 30, that number is 50%. Those who claim no religion. See, this is not a minor problem. This is a problem of enormous significance because the lack of belief in God does damage to us psychologically and spiritually. Right? Augustine knew that, didn't he? Lord, you made us for yourself, and therefore our heart is restless until it rests in thee. It's still true, isn't it? It's still true. The human heart is wired for God. When we forget about God, something goes deeply wrong with human beings. And so we, followers of Jesus, proclaimers of Jesus, have a special responsibility today. See, for me, it's not a question of, oh, here we are ever retreating from the, from the onslaught of secularism. No, no, this is the moment for us, everybody. This is our time. We who believe in Jesus Christ, we who believe in, in his God and Father, now have this enormous responsibility to proclaim him. This is our time. This is our time. So, Jesus. Who is Jesus? What is he about? You know, the earliest uh, Christians inevitably presented him katatagrapha, to use their Greek, according to the writings. They meant what we call the Old Testament, right? They read Jesus in light of the Old Testament. That's how they interpreted him, katatagrapha. So if we look at the Old Testament, especially I would say at the Psalms and the prophets, what do we find? we find a pretty clear description of the Mashiach, the Messiah, the Anointed One. Read the Psalms and Prophets, you find that when the Messiah comes, he will gather the tribes of Israel. 
Secondly, he will cleanse the holy temple. Thirdly, he will deal with the enemies of Israel. And fourthly, he will reign as Lord of the nations. Those four things, those four great tasks of the Messiah. And so when they named him, in Paul's language, Jesus Christos, that's his Greek version of Yeshua Mashiach, Jesus the Anointed One, Jesus Christ, we say in our English. They meant he's the one who accomplished those four great things. Now, mind you, in a very unexpected way, and that's part of the drama of the Gospels. But they said Jesus is the one who has gathered the tribes, who has cleansed the holy temple, who has dealt with the enemies of Israel, and who now reigns as the Lord of the nations. That's still our proclamation. That's still what evangelization is all about. So what I'm going to do in the course of the talk is just briefly go through those four missions of the Messiah and unpack them a little bit for you. Oop, this water, there we go, it's all sealed up. There we go. So first, to gather the tribes. In the Bible, everybody, God is a great gathering force. It's always the sign that God is at work, things get gathered in. The diabolical, by the way, is a scattering force. That's what the word means. Diabalain in Greek means to throw apart. It means to scatter, to divide. So our, our word devil and, and diablo and, and diable and all those words come from diabalain, to scatter. God's purpose is to gather his people into his family. What sin, sin is the demonic, the diabolic, the scattering. Now read those opening chapters of the book of Genesis and you see it. Is the human race in all these different ways scattered, divided. What's God's solution? He sends a kind of rescue operation in the form of a holy people a people that he would specially gather to himself so that by their magnetic power, they would in turn gather all the nations of the world. There's the mission of Israel. God's chosen people, his gathered people, but who now, by the very beauty and intensity and quality of their lives, would become a magnet for the whole world. Do you remember in um, the second chapter of the prophet Isaiah, Mount Zion, true pole of the earth. There all the tribes go up, the tribes of the Lord. That's gathered Israel, gathered in right praise of God. And by their magnetic power, this gathered people would then draw all the tribes of the world. That was Israel's purpose. What was the tragedy, however, of Israel, as you read through the Old Testament? That despite their great calling, Israel was often divided against itself. Israel often refused to follow the Torah. As a result, Israel was conquered frequently. Twice sent into terrible exile. The northern tribes sent by, by the Assyrians into exile. Then the famous Babylonian exile, the southern tribes are carried away. You see in this process, Israel, which is meant to be the gathering point of the world, has itself been scattered. Ah, but when the Mashiach comes, read the Psalms especially on this. Once you see this theme, it just echoes all through the Psalms. Once the Mashiach comes, he will gather the tribes together. For nationalistic purpose? No, for mystical purpose. So that the newly united Israel would now unite the whole world. Now, with that in mind, look at Jesus. Oh, I think it sheds enormous light on the life and the work and the preaching of Jesus. You know, when he first appears in the hills of Galilee, 
And his great message is, the kingdom of God is at hand. Oceans of ink have been spilled trying to explain what that means, the kingdom of God. But they say that what someone in first century Palestine would have heard is, oh, the tribes are being gathered. To say that God's kingdom had come, it meant the exile was over. The tribes of the nation are coming together. Now, watch Jesus. His open table fellowship, inviting not just the saints and the righteous, but inviting the sinners, the outcast, gathering in. Jesus going out to the woman at the well. Jesus going out to the man born blind. Jesus going out to Zacchaeus. See, he's not just being a, a nice, inclusive 21st century fellow. He's doing what the Mashiach was expected to do, gathering in Israel. Healing those who felt alienated from the community. Choosing 12 apostles, representative of all 12 tribes coming together. At the climax of his life, nailed to the cross, what do we hear in St. John's Gospel? When the Son of Man is lifted up, and that means on the cross, he will draw all people to himself. The scattering power of sin is overcome by this great act of God's gathering in. Now, just think, everybody, for a second, how, how really marvelous this is. As I'm laying out this, this theory, you say, well, isn't that a nice sort of, you know, mildly interesting theory? But you see how it's, it's confirmed in this room. How strange, isn't it, that we now, at the beginning of the 21st century, we thousands of miles away from, from Palestine, are yet gathered in the name of the God of Israel. It has, in fact, happened that through the magnetic power of Jesus Christ, the new Israel, all the nations of the world have been drawn in, magnetically attracted to him. You know those wonderful descriptions, especially in Mark's gospel, when it says that Jesus stood still, but they came at him from all sides. It happened then. Still happens, doesn't it? Still happens. He's the one who gathers the tribes. Second great task of the Mashiach of Israel, he would cleanse the holy temple. Now, folks, to get this, we have to go back to the very beginning of the Bible, the very first pages in the book of Genesis. As creation is being described in that beautiful, exalted poetry of Genesis, God says, Let there be light, and there was light. God says, Let the dry land appear, and so it happened. God said, Let it be filled with animals of all kind, and they, and they, they crept and crawled upon the earth, etc. The sun, the moon, the stars, the planets come forth. What's that story telling us? First of all, notice how it dethrones all false claimants to divinity. Think, sun, moon, stars, planets, mountains, animals, etc. were all in various cultures in the ancient world worshipped. The author of Genesis is saying, no, 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 no. Good, all these things, you bet. God found them good. He found the ensemble of them very good. But they're not God. They're creatures. Don't worship them. But now, now, we see whom and how we are to worship. See, Catholics recognize this. Does Genesis, the very opening verses, strike you as somewhat liturgical? As this stately procession comes forth. Let there be light, 
and then the stars, the planets, then the earth, and the things that crawl upon the earth. In a stately procession, you know, the first day, and evening came, morning followed, the second day, evening came, morning followed, the third day. It's this beautiful liturgical procession. Who comes last? We do. So human beings are created as the last part of God's good creation. Who comes last in a liturgical procession? Well, the priest or the bishop, right? Who's now going to lead the praise? Ah, now we get it. Nothing in the world is to be worshipped, least of all us. Rather, everything in the world is meant to offer its praise to God. Who leads the praise? We do. That's our task. You know, in some ways, that's, that's the whole Bible, everybody, in some ways. That's the whole Bible. That our task is to be priests of creation's praise of God. We, with our minds and wills and hearts and articulate speech, channel, as it were, the praise of the whole cosmos to God. And see, in that act, we discover who we are. We become rightly ordered. Here's a, a connection that uh, Pope Benedict many years helped me to see. He made this connection at uh, World Youth Day in Cologne. I think it was 2005. He told the young people there that the etymology of the word adoration is very interesting. Right? Adoratio in Latin. Ad ora. It means to the mouth. When you adore, you are mouth to mouth with God. See what that means? Aligned to God. Breathing in the divine life. Taking in the divine word. You're ordered properly to God when you adore God. So when you do that, you tend to fall into an inner harmony and the world around you tends to fall into harmony. Adoration is the key to peace. Why we say, by the way, glory to God in the highest and on earth peace to people of goodwill. Do you see how that's a formula? You see? I give glory to God in the highest, not to any creature, not to any country or culture or person or political party, a plague on all your houses. I give glory to God in the highest. And the result of that is peace. In here, and around me. Okay, on that reading, what sin? So we saw the first, it's a kind of scattering. Sin is always a scattering, a separation. Here, sin, bad praise. And you know, everybody, I, I, I put money on that as maybe the single uniting theme of the whole Bible. To lure us into right praise of God. But see, when I start praising money or power, pleasure, honor, persons, political parties, countries, whatever it is, when I start adoring those things, I fall apart. And the world tends to fall apart around me. You know, a line from uh, the Protestant theologian Paul Tillich I've always liked. Paul Tillich said, all you need to know about someone you can learn by asking one basic question. What do you worship? Isn't that good? I mean, everyone worships something. The atheist worships something, meaning something's of highest value to you. That word worship is from an older English, worth-ship. What's of highest worth to you? What's the highest value to you? Once I know that, I know all I need to know about you. Glory to God in the highest. Then peace will break out in here and around me. There's the story of the Garden of Eden. Why are Adam and Eve expelled from the garden? It's not because God's being difficult. It's a kind of spiritual physics. When we fall away from right praise, we fall apart. We disintegrate. We go from a garden of life to a desert. Does that make sense? 
Watch that theme, everybody, all through the Bible. Okay, so God's rescue operation when we fall into wrong praise, his people Israel. He wanted to form a people according to his own mind, his own heart. And, and, he wanted to teach them how to praise him. Do you ever wonder why in the Bible there's such a stress on the liturgy? You know, read through Deuteronomy and Leviticus and books like that, but really all through the Bible, an extraordinary emphasis on how to worship God. Whether it's in the tabernacle in the desert, whether it's in the great temple in Jerusalem, but we hear about the kind of animals to be used, the sort of sacrifices to be done, what the high priest and his attendants are to wear, how they do their sacrifices, etc., etc. And you think, why are we fussing with all this? It's because God wants to teach a people how to praise him correctly. Because he's needy and, and has got all kinds of emotional issues? No. God doesn't need our praise. Thomas Aquinas says that wonderfully. God doesn't, God doesn't need anything. God doesn't need our, our praise. But we need the praise of God. Does that make sense? That as we worship God, we become rightly ordered. And so God trains a holy people, Israel, to do it. Now, this takes place most fully in the holy temple in Jerusalem. There's been, by the way, an explosion of literature in recent years around the temple. It's really interesting to me. These wonderful books on what the temple meant. On top of Mount Zion, David's city, all the tribes go up to this place of right praise. They say, by the way, that the temple was decorated outside and inside with all sorts of symbols of the cosmos of planets and stars, the sun and the moon, animals. How come? Because they knew in their bones what I said a few minutes ago, that the right praise of the holy people Israel was not just for them. No, they were channeling the right praise of the whole cosmos. You know, by the way, where you see this, I spent uh, many years in France doing my doctoral work, and I, I fell in love with the Gothic churches. And what I love about them, so many things, but uh, you certainly see human figures all over the, the cathedrals, depictions of human beings. But all over the cathedrals are also planets and, and, and the sun and the moon and stars and animals and trees and plants. Same idea, same idea. Is our right praise is the right praise of the whole universe. Okay, that's where the temple is meant to be, what the temple was at its best. But what do we see throughout the Bible, especially in the prophets? A keen sense that the temple has become corrupt. It's not a place of right praise, a place where false gods are worshipped, a place of monetary gain, political ambition. And so the prophets rail against the temple, don't they? Read Jeremiah now, Isaiah, Amos, Hosea. But read especially some devastating texts from the prophet Ezekiel. Now Ezekiel is very interesting. He's a prophet, of course. But Ezekiel was also a temple priest carried away in the first round of the, of the Babylonian exile. So Ezekiel knew all about the temple and its system of praise. He knew everything I've just been telling you about the purpose of the temple. When you get home, take out your Bibles and read one of the most devastating texts in the whole scripture, Ezekiel chapter 10. He describes the Shekinah, it means the glory of Yahweh, the glory of God, up and leaving the temple. I mean, devastating, I say, because that was the whole raison d'etre of the temple. It was the place where God's glory dwelt. It's where heaven and earth met. But Ezekiel says, no, the corruption is such that God's glory, God's presence has up and left the temple, has left over the Mount of Olives to the east of the temple. That'll be very interesting in the New Testament, by the way. So, 
Israel begins to dream and hope. When the Mashiach comes, the Messiah, he will cleanse and restore the holy temple. Now, go a little later in the prophet Ezekiel. You find this beautiful prophecy. The Shekinah has left, but when the Messiah comes, when the glory of God returns to the temple and it becomes again a place of right praise, he says water will flow forth from its side for the renewal of the world. Remember that beautiful lyrical scene of the water coming forth and it gives rise to plants that, that give leaves that are used for medicine. From the side of the renewed temple, water will come. Okay. That's the temple. That's the expectation. Now Jesus. How wonderful, and it's a, it's a disturbing line. They say that a first century Jew hearing this line would probably have walked away from Jesus. Referring to himself, he says, you have a greater than the temple here. Now, I say, I mean, breathtaking for a first century Jew because the temple was everything. The temple was the meeting place of heaven and earth. It was the place of right praise. It was the center of everything. For a human being to say, in reference to himself, you have a greater than the temple here? But the point is, he meant it. What did you go to the temple for? Well, you went for instruction. That's why they had scribes and teachers there. What does Jesus say? No, no, come to me for instruction. Oh, you've heard it said in the Torah, which is taught in the temple, but I say, I'm the, the true teacher. You came to the temple to have your sins forgiven. What does Jesus say? No, no, come to me. My son, your sins are forgiven. I mean, how that scandalized people in his time. You see why. You came to the temple to be healed. No, Jesus says, come to me. As Jesus heals people of their physical ailments. You have a greater than the temple here. Why? Why? Now I'll put it in the great doctrinal language of our church. Because in Jesus... Two natures come together without mixing, mingling, or confusion. I mean the divinity of Jesus and the humanity of Jesus come together in the unity of his person. Now, I know that can sound very abstractly philosophical, but you see how that is temple language. What was the temple? It was the place of right praise, adoratio, when humanity would be mouth to mouth with divinity, reconciled. That's a cool word too, by the way, right? Cilia means your eyelashes. To be reconciled means your eyeball to eyeball again. See? Mouth to mouth. How beautiful how we describe. In fact, every time we, we recite the creed, God from God, light from light, true God from true God, begotten, not made, consubstantial with the Father, what we're saying is Jesus is the place where divinity and humanity meet. He's the place of adoration, of right praise. He's the place where we find integration. We learn again the inner and outer peace that God wants us to have. Okay, now flash forward to the end of Jesus' life. On the cross, what's happening? A great act, we say, of sacrifice. Within eyeshot of the temple, so Mount Calvary would have been right in eyeshot of the temple, just outside the city walls. The temple where thousands upon thousands of animals were sacrificed as an act of atonement, of reparation, of sorrow for sin. Jesus on the cross is the Lamb of God who takes upon himself the sin of the world. Read now those, those awful passion narratives. Cruelty and hatred and, and injustice and stupidity and all forms of human dysfunction are placed, as it were, on him. He becomes like the scapegoat on the Day of Atonement. All of Israel's sins are placed on the scapegoat. 
And so upon Jesus on the cross, the dysfunction of the human race is placed. But bearing those sins of the world, Jesus maintains his adoring unity with the Father, thereby dealing with sin, thereby making the definitive sacrifice, thereby summing up what the temple was all about, thereby offering the perfect act of adoratio to the Father. Now, notice something that we're probably going to miss in our time, but no first century Jew would have missed it. Jesus dies on the cross. The Roman soldier takes the spear and he, and he spears him in the side. And out comes, we hear, blood and water. And how St. John insists that his eyewitness saw this. An eyewitness. I'm telling you the truth. I saw it. The blood of the Eucharist, the water of baptism. Yes, indeed, as the church father said. But see, what first century Jew would have missed? The fulfillment of Ezekiel's prophecy. The Shekinah, the glory of Yahweh, up and left the temple. Oh, but the great day of the Mashiach, when the glory of God returns, then water will flow forth from the side of the temple for the renewal of the world. There's the water flowing forth from the side of Christ. The perfect sacrifice having been made, the temple having been fulfilled, the world now renewed by this great act of adoratio. Third task of the Messiah, and I'll need a drink of water before I get to the third task. How are we doing? Okay. Thirdly, the Messiah was expected to deal with the enemies of Israel. Now, we've seen Israel is God's rescue operation. By its unity, by its right praise, it would be the magnetic force by which all the nations would be drawn into unity. However, Israel, poor Israel, overrun, conquered, exiled, divided against itself. Oh, there's a glorious moment when David was king in a brief time under Solomon. But most of Israelite history, Egyptians and, and Assyrians and Amalekites and Babylonians and Greeks and Romans and so on, Israel's anything but the magnetic unifying force of the world. It seems to be just a conquered, divided, exiled nation. All the kings of Israel are fighters, but let's face it, most of them lost the fights they were in in the long run. Ah, but when the Mashiach comes, the Messiah, the Anointed One, he will deal with the enemies of Israel. Indeed, he will be a new David, the greatest of Israel's kings, the greatest warrior. Is Jesus a king? You bet. He's presented that way from page one of the New Testament. Is he therefore a fighter? You bet. From beginning to end of the New Testament. The thing is, though, he fought in the strangest way, didn't he? He fought in the most surprising, unexpected way. You know, one of the clues here I, I find fascinating is the Christmas story in St. Luke. And we think, well, it's a nice, you know, sentimental, beautiful little tale that warms our hearts at Christmas. And it is indeed that. Oh, but read it with more biblical eyes, and you'll see something else really powerful emerging. It's a tale of two kings, right? Because we hear about Caesar Augustus at the very beginning, king of the world. Why was he king of the world? He had the biggest army. And then we hear about this strange couple making their way from Nazareth to Bethlehem, and the woman gives birth to this little poor child, and it's in some kind of hostel or cave or something, wrapped in swaddling clothes. We're meant to see the setting up of a struggle between two kings and two types of kingship. But here's what gives away the game. We hear that an angel appears to the shepherds. Now again, we get all sentimental because we've seen so many pictures of angels and shepherds. What's the typical reaction to an angel in the Bible? <laughs> it's fear, right? Can you imagine this, this being coming from a higher place of existence, this, this extraordinary, overwhelming reality? So, of course, they were afraid. Angels always say, don't be afraid, which means people were afraid, right? 
So that's one angel who announces the coming of this, uh, this new king. And then we hear, if one, if one is overwhelming, it then says a host, we usually translate in English, but the word in the Greek behind that is strategos. And our words like strategy and strategic come from that word. Because you know what it means, everybody? It means an army. And with the one angel, there suddenly appeared an army of angels. One angel is terrifying. Imagine an army of them. That's the point. That's the point. I know Caesar Augustus is the king of the world because he's got this big Roman army behind him. It's nothing compared to the spiritual army behind this baby. See, and so Luke's gospel is set up as a story of these two kings. Now, watch as Jesus emerges in public life. From the beginning, he is opposed. Is everyone just delighted to see him? Well, I mean, some people are. Some take in his word, you know, with great spiritual hunger. Oh, but often, often, the reaction of Jesus is, is dislike, is, is hatred. They, they tried to kill him. They tried to arrest him. How like a refrain that runs through the whole gospel. It's a battle, you bet, from the beginning. With powers you can see, yeah, in many cases, and powers you can't see. Jesus comes as a warrior. But notice, please, he does not fight with the weapons of the world. How sensitive he is to that awful truth, you know. An eye for an eye, as Gandhi said, yes, making the whole world blind, right? You fight fire with fire, set the whole world on fire. Jesus says, someone strikes you on one cheek, turn and give him the other. He says, love your enemies. Well, is that the language of, of just passivity in the presence of evil? No, that's fighting language, if we understand it right. You know, stay with that image from Miss Matthew. If someone strikes you on the right cheek, it says, turn and give him the other. Well, see, in Jesus' time, you would never have used your left hand. It was considered unclean. So if you were striking someone on the right cheek, that meant you went like this. You were hitting him with the back of your hand. That was a sign of, of contempt. Right? You'd treat an inferior, a slave that way. So now listen to Jesus. If someone strikes you on the right cheek, don't fight back, but by God, don't run. Those are the two great responses typically, right? We fight or flight. Fight back or I run away. Don't fight, but don't run. Rather, stand your ground, turn the other cheek. In other words, in a provocative way, mirror that person's violence back to him and say by the very gesture you've made that you refuse to cooperate with the world he's living in. Now, watch how the great figures, I mean, think of Gandhi, think of Martin Luther King in my country, think of John Paul II in Poland, 1979. They understood this principle. Isn't it wonderful, as I'm here in the, in the British Isles, uh, uh, to think of Gandhi, a young law student in London, and with his you know, religious curiosity, begins reading the New Testament. And he goes to his Christian friends, and he says, oh, this is extraordinary what I'm reading in St. Matthew about, about loving your enemies and turn the other cheek. And his Christian friends all said, well, I mean, no one really takes that very seriously. <laughs> I, mean, I mean, no one can live that way. Well, Gandhi understood the power of it and actually practiced it rather powerfully in the India of his time. King in our, my country certainly understood it. John Paul, you know that moment? It's much written about now. 1979 when he's addressing a million people in that Victory Square in, in Warsaw. At the height of, of Soviet power, Soviet domination. Not one tank, not one gun, not one soldier behind him. But began speaking about God and about human rights and about human dignity and about creation and about redemption. And as he spoke to this crowd, the, the cry went up from it. We want God. We want God. We want God. And it went on, they say, for 15 minutes. Can you imagine? 15 minutes of a million people shouting, we want God. And they say John Paul just turned to the Polish government that was seated behind him. And he gestured as if to say, you're through. I mean, you might not know it yet, but you're through. And he was right, wasn't he? I mean, if you had said to me when I was a kid in the 1970s that the great Soviet empire would collapse with barely a shot being fired, 
I mean, we think you would lost your mind. And that a major protagonist in that struggle would be the Pope? That's what happened, though. These people unleashing the power of turning the other cheek. It's not fighting, but it's not running. It's a provocative challenge. A morally powerful, provocative challenge to the evil of the world. Okay, now let me just cut to the chase. Jesus preaches this, and Jesus fully exemplifies it. The climax of his life. Again, those passion narratives. Stupidity and violence and hatred and injustice and all of it. Betrayal, denial, all of it. All of human dysfunction. All the darkness of the world. Powers that you can see and powers that you can't see. Come at him. What does he do? He doesn't fight in the, in the Davidic manner. Fighting fire with fire. But rather on the cross, Jesus turns the other cheek. The word from the cross, Father, forgive them. They know not what they do. What is that but this infinitely powerful mirroring back to the dysfunctional world, its dysfunction? Father, forgive them. The divine mercy swallowing up all the wickedness of the world in the infinite ocean of the divine mercy. Was he a warrior on that cross? You bet. A Davidic warrior, yeah, but not in the Davidic manner. How do we know that he won, by the way? Well, here's at the very heart of our evangelical faith. You know, they say, um, maybe the sheerest, purest, clearest sign that somebody was not the Mashiach of Israel would have been his death at the hands of Israel's enemies. And that should make sense, right? He's, he's meant to gather the tribes and cleanse the temple and deal with the enemies and now reign as Lord of the nations. Well, the clearest sign possible that you're not the Mashiach would be your crucifixion at the hands of the Romans. And can't you sense it, everybody, in those masterfully told stories in the New Testament when they communicate to us what it felt like for those first followers of Jesus to realize he, he wasn't. He, he wasn't what we thought he was. The most natural reaction in the world to his death on the cross. Therefore, how do you explain? I, I mean, even on historical grounds, not just theological, but even historical grounds, how do you explain that they came bursting forth with the message that the crucified Jesus is in fact the Mashiach? The only way, it seems to me, and I'm speaking really more as an historian here, the only way to really explain that is the overwhelming fact of the resurrection. Having taken upon himself all the wickedness of the world, having pronounced the divine forgiveness, Jesus now returns from death alive. He always does two great things in the resurrection appearances, doesn't he? He always shows his wounds. It's a very eloquent, important gesture, isn't it? Don't forget what the sin of the world did to me. Remember that book, some might be old enough to remember it from the 70s, I'm Okay and You're Okay? Remember that book? That's a stupid book. <laughs> because I'm not okay and neither are you. I mean, we're all pretty lost. The Lord of life came. Listen to St. Peter's early charismatic sermon. The author of life came. And you kill them. See, the wounds of Jesus are always a reminder of our dysfunction. They're a reminder that the enemies of Israel are still alive and well. But then, then, having shown his wounds, he says, Shalom. That beautiful word that runs like, a, again, a refrain through the Bible. Shalom. Peace. Peace. We killed God. And God returned in forgiving love. Hey, you want a one-liner summary of the gospel? That's it, I think. We killed God. And God returned in forgiving love. What does that mean? That means that nothing can separate us from God's love. Doesn't Paul say it in Romans? I'm certain that neither death nor life, 
neither angels nor principalities, neither height nor depth, nor any other creature could ever separate us from the love of God. How does Paul know it? Because we killed God and God returned in forgiving love. That's the victory. That's the victory. He did deal with the enemies of Israel, but not the way King David would have. He dealt with the enemies of Israel through the power of the cross. And then just I'll briefly mention the last one, which kind of sums up the other ones. Finally, the Mashiach would reign as Lord of the nations. See, uh, pious Jews knew that the king of the Jews, the Mashiach, would be by extension the king of the world because he'd attract the rest of the world. That's the idea. Therefore, who's the first great evangelist in the Gospels? Pilate. Because <laughs> Pilate puts a sign over the cross, right? The cross, the ultimate sign of Roman power. You cross us, pun intended, we'll do this to you. On that cross, meant as a, a bit of mockery, Pilate puts, Jesus Nazarenus Rex Judeorum, Jesus of Nazareth, the king of the Jews. Oh, and I mean, people, of course they were offended. Oh, don't, don't, you, you say he, he claimed to be. And how wonderful. James Joyce, by the way, loved this, that, that Pilate said, quod scripsy, scripsy, you know, what I've written, I've written. Because it makes him, despite himself, the first great evangelist. And he put it in the three great languages of, of that time and place, in, in Hebrew, Latin, and Greek. So nobody would miss the message. The king of the Jews, therefore the king of the world, there he is. There he is. Now read Paul. By the way, Paul, who was Rabbi Shaul, wasn't he, from Tarsus, this young kid full of nothing but zeal for the traditions of his fathers, this smart student of the Torah who knew everything I've been saying and a thousand times more about the messianic expectations, that Shaul, he hears about this crucified carpenter from Nazareth who, of course, can't be the Mashiach. He knew that, as anyone would have. Boy, how do you explain him, by the way? outside of the appearance of the risen Christ to him. Shaul, Shaul, why are you persecuting me? When Shaul sees the risen Christ and becomes Paul the apostle, what's his message? You got a new king, everybody. That's the message. See, we spiritualize it right away when he says, Jesus Curios. Read his letters now. I see over and over again, Jesus Curios. Jesus is Lord. But see, who was Curios in those days? Kaiser, Curios. Caesar was Lord. In fact, that's how they greet one another. They'd say, Kaiser Curios. And you'd say, Kaiser Curios back. Hey, Caesar's our, our Lord. How edgy of St. Paul. It wasn't harmless little spiritual pieties. That was edgy, dangerous stuff. When Paul said, Jesus Curios. Jesus is Lord. He's the king of the world. And I want the whole world to know about it. You see now, by the way, why Paul spent a lot of time in prison. <laughs> and why they cut his head off. See, because they knew he wasn't trading in little spiritual pieties. They knew this was revolutionary language. By the way, everybody, it still is. Who's the king of the world? I don't mean in some, in some crude worldly sense. You know, who cares? But who's the one to whom our final allegiance is due. It's Jesus. It's nobody else. It's Jesus. He's the one to whom our final allegiance is due. He's the king who's won the definitive victory. Here's just the last thing on this one. Uh, take out your Bibles when you get home and, and open up to the Gospel of Mark. Scholars still tend to say the first Gospel written. The opening line. He says, The Gospel of Jesus Christ the Son of God. Well, gospel, euangelion, is the Greek he used there. Good news, right? We know what euangelion meant in that part of the world. It's what the Roman emperor or Roman general would offer when he won a great victory. He would send evangelists ahead of him with the euangelion, the good news that Caesar's won a victory. See how edgy these first Christians were. Again, why most of them were martyred. It's not, it's not surprising at all. I've got the real euangelion. 
doesn't have a thing to do with Caesar. In fact, it's got to do with someone that Caesar killed, but whom God raised up. This, and he calls him Jesus Christos, Yeshua Mashiach. And then just to rub it in, I love this. He calls him in the Greek, Witos Tutau, son of God. And we say, oh, that's sure, that's a nice religious title, the son of God. But see, in Roman times, who was the son of God? The emperor. Remember Julius Caesar killed in 44 BC, and then the Senate voted that he would be deified after his death. He was now a, a divine, divus Caesar. Well, I mean, look, I'm from Chicago. I know what Julius, Julius Caesar was like a wily street politician. I mean, I, I'm, I know what that's like from Chicago. But they made him a god, right? Well, then his, his adopted son, Caesar Augustus, inherits the title, Witos Tutau, son of God. And then it was passed on to the Roman emperors. <laughs> so St. Mark says, no, no, I got you on Gelion, not about Caesar. It's about Yeshua Mashiach, this new David, this new warrior, whom Caesar killed and God raised up. And guess what, everybody? He's the son of God, not Caesar. That's evangelization. That's evangelization. Edgy then, edgy now. Dangerous then, dangerous now. Life-changing then, life-changing now. Look, gather the tribes. We're still doing it. That's the church's job, to gather in the tribes of the world. Cleanse the holy temple, you bet. The liturgy, the source and summit of the Christian life. We offer to the Father every day the sacrifice of Christ. Dealing with the enemies of Israel, you bet. The church and its great mission on behalf of the poor. The church's opposition to all forms of dysfunction. Proclaiming the Lord of the nations, you bet. That's called evangelization. Still our task, everybody. And I'll end with this. This is the uh, motto of the, of the archdiocese, huh? Crux spes unica. <laughs> Imagine a time machine. Bring someone from the first century Roman era to this room. And they look up, and, and of course they can read Latin, and they say, the cross, our one hope. <laughs> I mean, they would think, okay, this is a comedy going on here. And there's a guy up there speaking, he's a religious figure of some kind, and look what he's got around his neck. He's got this? Are you joking? I mean, this terrified people. It was meant to, right? It was state-sponsored terrorism. Is if, if you, you cross us, we're going to put you on this awful instrument of torture. How wonderful, how wonderful, strange that the Christians held up that cross as a kind of taunt. You think that scares us? No. God has conquered the wickedness of the world through that cross. You think that leads us to despair? Uh-uh. The cross is our one hope. Boy, everybody, if you get that, if you let that motto sink in, you get the whole drama of evangelization. God bless you as you continue in that work. And thanks, everybody, for having me tonight.